Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the York Festival of Ideas. It's lovely to have you all here. I'm looking forward to a very interesting evening. I'm your chair for this evening. My name is Jane Grenville. I'm a retired member of staff um, from the University of York. I was in the archaeology department, um, so I have considerable interest in the domestication of animals. Um, and I was also quite famous during my time uh, in the university for being one of the people who brought their dogs to work fairly regularly. So um, I'm very much looking forward to this. And I think my, my dogginess is the reason why I was asked to chair this session. So that's me. I'm going to be in the background for most of the time. Uh, and we'll then um, sort out the questions at the end. Um, it now gives me enormous pleasure to introduce your speakers for the evening, uh, who are the authors of a very remarkable uh, uh, new book, uh, A Dog's World. Um, I'm not going to give away uh, exactly what it's about, but I am going to give away the fact that they are a philosopher and a biologist. So our philosopher and bioethicist this evening is Jessica Pierce who has been writing and lecturing uh, about the moral contours of human animal relationships and sustainability for over 20 years now. Um, and she's a leading scholar in the area of, um, of environmental bioethics. She's a faculty affiliate at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical School uh, in the States. Uh, and she's written 11 books of which uh, my favorite title is Run, Spot, Run, uh, The Ethics of Keeping Pets. Um, uh, but yes, she's, she's written a lot. Uh, and uh, with her tonight um, is Mark Burkhoff, who is the Professor Emeritus of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, and he has published 31 books and he thinks over 170 papers. Um, so uh, he would be very popular for our research uh, excellence framework, would he not? Um, and um, he, his uh, books include Canine Confidential, Why Dogs Do What They Do, which of course is a, a question that we're all very interested in. Um, so they have uh, co-written a few books, and this is the latest that they're here to talk to us uh, tonight uh, about that. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Jessica and Mark to tell us more about this extraordinary book, which I've been, I've been reading, and it's exploring what dogs would do without us. Would they survive and thrive? So I'm keen to find out more. And please join me in welcoming Jessica and Mark. I'm going to hand over immediately to Jessica. She's then going to hand on to Mark. So here's Bella enjoying the new release of her book. You may have laughed at your dog for tiptoeing through puddles, not being able to um, effectively hunt squirrels or um, getting sore paws on a hike. And you may have said to your dog, you know, you would never survive without me. I say that to Bella actually pretty frequently. But if you were to phrase this as a serious question for your dog, do you really think you'd be able to survive on your own without my help? Your dog might say, well, sure, why wouldn't I? If you press her for some details. You know, how would you stay warm? What would you do when it rains? What would you eat? And most importantly, wouldn't you be lonely without me? Your dog might tell you that she would just go next door and live with your neighbor, who would likely provide the basics of food and shelter and probably also love. Annoyed by this apparent lack of loyalty, you might press your dog and ask, what she would do if there were no neighbor, and if there were, in fact, no humans at all, how then would she manage? With a sigh, she might say to you, just use your imagination. 
And in a dog's world, that's exactly what we've tried to do. We tried to take readers into an imaginary world in which humans have suddenly disappeared and dogs are left on their own. In the book, we broke this down into two main questions about dogs. First, could dogs survive without their human counterparts? Are they still capable of living on their own as wild animals without help from and relationships with humans? And second, which is perhaps a, the even more interesting question, what would happen to dogs over time? What are some of the possible evolutionary trajectories of post-human dogs as human selection is replaced by natural selection? Would dogs look or behave anything like the animals we now call our best friends? So would dogs survive? Let's consider canine survival. If humans disappeared tomorrow, about a billion dogs would be left on their own. And the first clue to whether dogs would survive lies in the basic demographics of dog populations. Right now, dogs occupy all corners of the globe they exploit diverse ecological niches, and they live in a wide variety of relationships with humans. And although many people when asked to picture a dog will think of the furry friend curled up on the couch next to them or a dog walking on a leash with a, with a person, only about 20% of the billion or so dogs on the planet actually live as um, captive dogs, as pets. The other 80% of the world's are, dogs are free ranging, um, which is an umbrella term that includes village dogs, street dogs, unconfined community and feral dogs. So in other words, most of the dogs on the planet are already living on their own to some degree without direct support from um, humans within a homed environment. Although, the 80 million free ranging dogs have a lot more independence of movement and behavior than captive dogs and have developed a range of survival skills. Almost all dogs on the planet currently rely on humans for one key resource and that's food subsidies, either in the form of direct feeding or in the form of garbage and waste. So the loss of anthropogenic or human generated food would present the most significant survival challenge to dogs during the, media, the immediate aftermath of human disappearance and in the transition years to a post-human future. During the first few years after human disappearance, there would probably be fairly high mortality as dogs transition to a post-human future. But after some rough years, dogs would likely adapt to life on their own. Dogs ret retain many of the traits of their wild relatives, the jackals, coyotes, and wolves. So they haven't forgotten how to do things like forage, hunt, find mates, raise children, get along in groups, and defend themselves. And these skills would simply be put back to work. So the answer to our first question, would dogs survive the loss of humans, is yes. Um, they almost certainly would. Which brings us to the next question. What would happen to dogs once they are decoupled from humans? Dogs and humans have lived in close association for at least 15,000 years, perhaps as much as 40,000 years or, or even quite a bit longer. Dogs are the only canid species to have undergone domestication. We're also the first animal to be domesticated by quite um, a long shot, and we're likely the only animal to have been domesticated by hunter-gatherers, with other animals being domesticated after the development of agriculture. The domestication process has strongly shaped who dogs are up to this point. So the phenotypic profile of dogs, their, their morphology, their body shape, their physiology, and their behavior is largely the result of human, um, intentional human interference. In a post-human future, this 20,000 odd year domestication experiment would abruptly stop. Human directed selection would cease 
and dogs would begin to drift in the currents of natural selection. And where exactly these currents would take them is one of the great unknowns and um, something Mark and I found um, really interesting to explore in this book. One of the things that people often say when we talk about the book is, well, it's obvious dogs will just go back to being wolves, but evolution doesn't, um, doesn't rewind in this way. So as dogs become whoever it is they're gonna become, they're not gonna be, they're not gonna go back to being wolves. They're going to become something entirely or at least largely new. To explore the possible evolutionary trajectories of post-human dogs, we made a huge chart of all the possible factors that might influence the evolution of dogs in the future. It was, it was really long. I'm not gonna even dare to, to share the whole thing. Um, it was several pages, but it fell roughly into five categories. Um, and that's where Mark and I are gonna focus briefly. And I'm gonna just introduce these five categories and then I'm gonna hand things over to Mark and let him fill in some detail. So the five categories are food and feeding ecology, reproduction, social organization, emotional and cognitive capacities, and um, morphology. And um, I, I, as I go through very briefly the introduction to each of these topics, I'm gonna to just show a couple of photos that we included in the book um, that were taken by Italian dog researcher, Marco Ada, and they're of, just of free ranging dogs in Bali. And they're, they're really beautiful pictures. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the main and most consequential challenge for post-human dogs is gonna be the loss of human food resources, the presence of which has been one of the key drivers of dog evolution. If humans disappeared along with their garbage, waste, and stores full of bagged kibble, dogs would quickly have to find other sources of food. Because dogs are behaviorally flexible and because they're dietary generalists, they could likely survive on a wide range of edibles, including plants, insects, berries, small mammals, birds, and perhaps even some larger prey. Their meal plans would depend a lot on where they live, how big they are, and what shape their body is. Reproductive strategies are also going to need to evolve quickly. Dogs will need to find mates, engage in courtship, bear and raise young. And I had to just include some puppy pictures because uh, puppies. The mating and reproductive strategies of post-human dogs likely won't need to shift as dramatically as their feeding ecology. Many different forms of social organization could emerge and work well in a world without humans, including the formation of bonded pairs, small groups, and even larger packs. Alternatively, some dogs may live mainly solitary lives coming together only when necessary. Dogs have been selectively bred by humans for certain behavioral traits, including a general propensity for friendliness and malleability and breed specific functional skills such as pointing, fetching, herding, and guarding. Selection for these traits has been driven by an interest in the physical characteristics of dogs, by the usefulness of these traits in relation to human pursuits, and um, especially over the last century or two by human aesthetic whims and fancies. Taken outside the context of human canine relations, some of these physical and behavioral traits may serve dogs well and be preserved, perhaps even enhanced by evolution and others may not. What might post-human dogs look like? Well, it's hard to say because morphological features will evolve in response to ecological pressures feeding ecologies and distinct features of the ecological niche that a given population of dogs might fill. Dogs are already the most morphologically diverse species on the planet. Um, think about the three pound teacup multipoo um, compared to the 120 pound wolf, Irish wolfhound. Um, one possibility is that dogs will eventually all become middle-sized, give or take 35 pounds. 
Um, an equally viable possibility is that dogs of the future will speciate into smaller and larger types. And this is a picture of my dog friend, Poppy, who we kind of took as a maybe prototype dog of the future. This is perhaps what, what dogs will look like um, if, they, if they follow a pattern of becoming medium-sized and all of one color um, uh, without any um, extreme features. Natural selection will probably weed out physical traits that are maladaptive, like extremely foreshortened skulls, um, ex excessive skin folds, and extremely short or extremely long limbs. Things like floppy tails, floppy ears, and curly tails might disappear if they inhibit dog-dog communication and serve no functional purpose. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks to Jessica. Um, I'm just going to repeat a couple of points Jessica made and then go through some of those general categories um, she mentioned. But some of the important ones, I think, <clears throat> worth reiterating is that so many dogs live on their own or are free ranging. So the dogs with whom most people are familiar is just a fraction of the dogs in the world, um, you know, homed dogs who have regular meals, bed, um, veterinary care. <clears throat> and love, we hope, although dog abuse is not as uncommon as a lot of people think. Um, dogs are really are diverse due to human selection. I mean, we've interfered in their lives in many, many ways, but we also control everything they do, basically. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a bit. Um, <clears throat> dogs do share a common wolf ancestor. And I think it's important to remember that they still have wolf genes and wolf memory traces or engrams in their brains. So under the right circumstances, wolf behavior can exhibit itself or what we call wolf behavior, but it could be just as well um, dog behavior as well. Um, so going through some of the categories, let me just kind of um, start with size. And in the book, we called it the shape of the future. Um, a lot of people, when we asked them, you know, who would survive, they, they would go, well, big dogs. Um, and, but that's not necessarily so. So, I mean, big dogs will be competitors with other carnivores because dogs are carnivores. Um, and they'll become members of wild communities. And, and that's really important to remember because so many people, even today, think of dogs as artifacts. When I, when I was a grad student studying dogs and working on feral dogs with some students, free ranging and feral, you know, some people would say, well, they're just artifacts. And one of the things we do in the book is we talk about what are called life history strategies, which look at size, shape, um, age, at reproductive maturity, litter size, the sex ratio of litters, longevity. <clears throat> and people would say, well, dogs don't really have life histories, which to me is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard from a biologist, because of course they have life histories. Their life histories, when they are with us, are determined by us. It's equally likely small dogs will survive. They'll be fast. They could run really tricky courses. They won't have as much of a need for food or calories, so they won't be perhaps um, viewed as competitors with other animals in the wildlife community. So trying to generalize on size and who will survive, I think is fraught with error. In terms of food, um, dogs who are on their own can be quite successful hunters. And once again, depending on their size, um, you know, that it will determine how many calories they need, because that's the way biologists sort of cash it out is you've got to at least have the same number of calories coming in as going out. So in terms of food, dogs should be able to do quite well getting their own meals. And for some dogs, um, domestication has selected against what we call the killing bite. But, but once again, um, I've seen in person feral and free ranging dogs who do quite well on their own. And so saying that dogs will have trouble, you know, getting their, the square meals they need is not quite so. Some will, 
I mean, in the first generation of dogs who are here without us, who have gotten regular mail, meals from humans, um, on the one hand, they may not um, be able to go out and find, capture, kill, and then <clears throat> eat other animals. On the other hand, some of them might really welcome that opportunity because so many dog food diets are just bland and really aren't very good for the dogs at all. So I don't see much of a problem in dogs of different sizes and shapes surviving in different ecosystems and also getting the meal plans they need to survive <clears throat> and thrive. A part of thriving, of course, would be um, finding partners with whom to make their children. Well, one change among dogs is that they've gone from two heats a year, these would be females, to they've gone from one heat a year, characteristic of wolves and wild canids, to two heats a year. So that might increase the odds of a female getting pregnant. Um, some people wonder whether um, females and, and males as well could be good parents because among home dogs, usually <laughs> the pups are ripped away from the mother. So the mother doesn't have the joy of raising her own children. And the father is often not around. You know, he comes in, mates and leaves. Um, so I think it's a fair question to wonder whether males and females could be good parents, but I don't have any doubt that they would be. And there are studies that show that this is the case. There'll also be a group of individuals who we call allo parents or helpers and helpers could be aunts and uncles or older siblings who partake in the rearing of young children and will provide food. They could provide warmth if they need it and safety. So I think taken as a whole, there just doesn't seem to be any reason once again, why enough young dogs wouldn't survive from generation to generation and ultimately lead to sustainable populations. But of course, that'll depend on habitat <clears throat> and who's around. <clears throat> and the question of who's around leads into questions about sociality, uh, the tendency of animals to form groups and social organization. And so once again, it's really important to keep in mind and I, I always reiterate this because when dogs are on their own, they're going to become members of wild communities. And among the options for the way in which they live, we in the book, we call it the three C's. They can compete with other animals, they can coexist, or they could cooperate. Um, they'll be vying for space in which to live, home ranges, uh, territories that they may defend. Um, places to have families, um, places to put food and protect the food from interlopers. So when you begin to think of that, it becomes, it becomes a bit more complex. But one of the things that'll be working for dogs is that they do have the common wolf ancestors and they were highly social. So I think it's fair to say that many dogs have a proclivity to live with other um, other beings. And so in my field work in Wyoming years ago on wild coyotes, we've seen alliances formed with free ranging dogs in the study area, and they may compete with one another and they may harm one another, but they'll also play with one another. And one of the joys is that young coyote pups and young wolf pups, for example, will play with dogs because they don't really go, I'm wolf, I'm coyote, or, and you're a dog. So in terms of sociality, <clears throat> the span of social relationships we see among wild canids could be solitary individuals, individuals living as mated pairs, or individuals living in different sorts of packs from sort of loosely or um, organized aggregations to extremely and highly functio functional coordinated groups where there are divisions of labor in terms of hunting, guarding food, acquiring territory, defending territory, and raising, um, sort of communal raising of the young. And there is really no reason at all um, that dogs on their own won't be, won't be able to do that successfully, and probably highly successfully if they're in the right ecosystem with um, 
if you will, with a friendlier group of potential um, competitors. In terms of their inner lives, we're talking about their cognitive abilities, you know, how smart they are, their emotional capacities. And, and, and once again, um, a lot of the work done in labs shows that dogs can be very clever. Um, having watched free ranging dogs for countless hours, I can tell you that they are equally clever. And, you know, there's no reason to think that the, their, um, their emotional capacities won't allow them to assess a so, social situation. You know, for example, are they risk averse? Are they, are they risk takers? Um, are they bold? Um, are they more um, hesitant? Are they introverts or extroverts? So once again, the individual characteristics of a dog really, really come into play here. And that's why it's so hard to say that members of certain breeds or dogs of a certain size will or will not survive. I mean, the dogs who won't survive will be the dogs who can't breed on their own, obviously, or give birth on their own. There's no reason to think that um, free ranging dogs might not be, or post human dogs might not be emotionally intelligent. You know, will they be able to learn things by observation or just learn by trial and error? So, of course, they will. And one thing they'll do when they can is play. And the reason I mention that is simply because play is really important for a number of different reasons. It, helps to socialize individuals. It's good for physical activity, um, the training response of building bones, tendons, muscles, and joints. <clears throat> and it's also good for aerob uh, developing aerobic and anaerobic conditioning, which, which dogs will have to have just like wolves and other carnivores have today. They'll, be able, they'll have to be able to make really rapid, um, really powerful surges rest a minute and do it again. Or dogs are cursorial um, running animals and they may just have to run at an anaerobic and sometimes uh, aerobic and anaerobic level at some times. So these skills will come in as will cognitive training, like learning how hard they can bite another individual during play and learning how to negotiate either flat or more mountainous mountainous terrain. So summing up the evolutionary trajectories, I think down the line, dogs won't come back to being wolves. Um, maybe they'll home in on a common size um, across populations, but we really don't know. And maybe they'll home in on a common, like coat texture or um, the length of their hair. But all in all, like Jessica said, you know, there's really no reason to be pessimis pessimistic that over time dogs won't form sustaining populations. Thank you. This was a really interesting exercise in biology, um, writing this book and, and researching it. But um, for me, and I think it's true for Mark also, the most interesting aspect of it was ethical. Um, and reading about the lives of dogs living on their own now really made me think um, in new ways about Bella, my dog, and um, the, the contours of, of human canine relations now. So, um, so really the book isn't about the future, it's about the now. And I think the most important effect of thinking about post-human dogs and how they might flourish without us is simply to decenter us to, um, we have a tendency to think of dogs, to view dogs through um, a very human lens for what they offer to us as companions, as um, benefits, ben beneficial to our health, a sort of furry Prozac or, um, useful for work or sport or just nice to look at. Um, but often the lives that we ask dogs to live are a pale reflection of what they could be. Um, and I think the most succinct way to put this is we ask dogs to, to not be dogs, we, we de-dog them. And in trying to do better in living with 
our dogs now, the dogs who we know and love. Um, I think it's really helpful to, to remember that they're animals, that they're canids, um, and consider allowing them to be dogs as much as possible, whenever possible. Um, one, um, one way to do this is to, you know, read up on canine cognitive science, you know, the research that's coming out of cognitive science labs. And it's, it's really interesting. It's really helpful. You know, for example, you know, one of the things that um, becomes very clear when you read about who dogs are is that, that they, instead of being visual creatures like we are, they see the world through their nose. So we can find opportunities, many opportunities throughout the day and night with our, our dog companions to let them see the world more fully through their noses. Um, so providing opportunities for dogs to sniff as much and at whatever pace they want to. And you know, one of the, the really common sights, at least around here is people walking with a dog on a leash, which incidentally is a very unnatural, as, do, as Mark said, dogs are cursorial. They, it's not natural for them to walk at a walking pace in a straight line down a sidewalk. Um, that's a, not a very dog-like way of interacting with the world. It's a human-like way. Um, and we kind of force them to go along at our heel, but there are ways to let them have um, more control over their, their sensory environment, for example, while well, walking simply to let them set the pace, let them set the direction, you know, in as much as that's safe and possible. And letting them have as much time off leash as they can. And letting them do things that are dog natural, like sniff each other's butts, which tends to make humans kind of uncomfortable, but is a perfectly um, normal and polite dog activity. I think even more useful than reading cognitive science for the average dog owner would be to read some of the material on free ranging dogs and how they live. Um, that was very eye opening for me. And um, we just get to see dogs on their own, making their own choices, setting their own agenda and, you know, see them as animals situated within ecological communities where the center of their world is not necessarily us. Um, and then, you know, by decentering us, really beginning to see the range of possibilities that um, are available to dogs and just how limiting the four walls of a human home can be. And as one um, really quick example of this, um, Mark mentioned space use. So, you know, biologists use the concept of home range to um, talk about you know, the area that, that an individual animal might traverse during the normal activities of the day, food gathering, mating, and caring for young. Um, the research on home range in free ranging dogs um, is really, there's huge variation. Some um, observations find dogs having a home range of, that's quite small, maybe half an acre. Other dogs have a home range that's up to 7,000 acres large, which, you know, if you think about the, the space constriction um, imposed on homed dogs today, you know, even a dog with a, a half, acre, half acre backyard would be considered um, extremely lucky and dogs are not, it's actually illegal in the US and I think also in the UK for dogs to roam freely. Um, they, they just are not allowed to, to engage in in that behavior. Sometimes they don't wanna do anything exciting, but just take a nap. And I just, I have some just pictures of dogs, which they just make me happy. Dogs make me happy. It makes me happy to look at pictures of dogs. So I'm gonna close with some pictures of dogs flourishing now. Um, it isn't all that pleasant to think about a world in which we're not here. But um, there are a lot of reasons to believe that if and when we're gone, dogs will survive and life will go on. Um, and I think it's healthy us, for us to begin to think in this way and to, to decenter ourselves, because when we decenter, 
then we can start to engage in really fruitful, non-anthropocentric thinking about who dogs are and what they need. And in imagining who they might become without us, we can get fresh insight into who they are now and how our relationships with them can benefit both of us. We may ask our dogs jokingly, what would you do without me? And they might indulge us with a wag and a bark, all the while imagining all the dog possibilities. And that is the end. And we would love to take questions from the audience. I've got a few questions to, to kick off with, and I've got a load of questions of my own. I think we're going to have to engage in a, an email exchange afterwards. Um, but uh, the, the first thing that somebody asked me, which um, seemed a very interesting question, is um, thinking about that first generation of, uh, of dogs without humans, did anybody do a study of what happened when the area around Chernobyl emptied out? What happened to the dogs? Does anyone know? Yeah. yeah. Mark, you want to take it? Yeah, the dogs around Chernobyl had a lot of human help. I mean, it's a myth that they were on their own. I mean, it's that's cutting through the chase, but the guards there and the humans there fed the dogs. And there's a there's a man there now who's a grad student, I believe at Cambridge, could be Oxford. I know I shouldn't confuse the two, but he's at one of the two. You're welcome. You're talking to York here. You can say what you like about Oxford. I know, and thank you <laughs> about that. But, um, but yeah, and there's been articles recently, you know, clearly showing that the guards and the humans there have been provisioning the dogs regularly. So Chernob Chernobyl's not a good model. And when we asked people, you know, about the fate of dogs, and they said large dogs rather than small dogs, a lot of them said, well, you can just use Chernobyl as an example. And um, it's a great question, but they're just not on their own. Okay, that's great, thanks. Uh, here's one from Francis Brock, who says, Ted Karasoti's book, Merle's Door, tells great story of what a dog's life could be like, but it's sadly not so available to most of us to let our dogs late have such a free life. Your work is really important to remind us to see our companion dogs as themselves, not extensions of ourselves. And thank you for talking about it this evening. So it's just... Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I can say one thing, because Ted's a really good friend of mine, and I've been there with him and his dogs. I mean, there's plenty of opportunities that people can have if they seek them out, maybe not in the UK, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but there's lots of areas people can go with their dogs and let them run free, as long as the dogs have some manners, or no, as long as the people have manners and care about what their dogs do. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And I, I would just add to, I, I love that book. That's one of my favorite books. And I think one thing that, what, what this, um question reminds us is that very few dogs and humans can actually create this sort of perfect life for a dog and having a dog is for for most of us a matter of making daily compromises um, but the thing is we tend to make expect dogs to do about 90 percent of the compromising and we do about 10 percent and i think what mark and i are are aiming toward is maybe it could be a little more like 50 50. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Yep. I mean, even even 70 30 would be an improvement yeah. for 99% yeah. of homed captive dogs. Yep. Yeah. 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 I think small, small gardens as opposed to big American yards are quite an issue here. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Mine, mine wander in and out in the summer, but it's a tiny little plot just out there there's they, yeah. they, you know they can go 20 feet and they get to the back gate so yeah. um what is the biggest the biggest challenge you've come across in your research that's an interesting question hmm. what, biggest it, challenge intellectual challenge or <laughs> about, um i think one of the challenges with free-ranging dogs i'm not sure if this is the point of the question but um one thing that was challenging is there isn't that much research. Yeah. You know, it's it's kind of a black hole, which is really exciting because there's so much to learn. Um, but, you know, dogs are kind of um, excluded from 
like zoology textbooks often don't have an entry for dogs. And if they do, it's a little tiny paragraph. So um, there's that that was a challenge. Um, yeah. They, they are seen because they've, I mean, I'm an archeologist and I'm very interested in the way in which the, the human dog relationship yeah. has molded human society as well as the way in which it's changed dogs. Um, but I think that's made zoologists sort of see them as you said, as an artifact, which- Yeah, I think that's a, a really nice way to put it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, buried in the literature though is a lot, I mean, it's, it's scary to me that 40 years ago, I had a grad student doing free ranging and feral dog studies in the US. And even before that, there were studies done looking particularly as that dogs, uh, free ranging dogs preying on wildlife, for example. Um, but, you know, it, the, in terms of the physical challenge, it wasn't that hard at all to do the work in terms of getting people to see dogs as carnivores, which, you know, who they are, um, yeah. was trying. But I think there was a really big uh, switch in the 80s, give or take 30 or 40 years ago, when people started doing more work on free ranging dogs. And I mean, there's been long term projects going on in Italy, of free ranging dogs, um, long term projects in um, East Africa, the problem was trying to get them published. And I think that that's a very important thing because I was told by somebody who studies free ranging dogs now that, and even my student was excluded from science meetings. Yeah, where do you <laughs> get published with stuff? Why like would you study free ranging dogs? Yeah. And that's, that's radically changed, but it was that arrogance of my colleagues while I was doing studies of free ranging coyotes for almost 10 years, we were getting data on dogs, but it was hard to get the dog data out because they weren't shoved into a laboratory and by the it, way, forced to do certain things. Yeah, it's, a, it, it's a, a ridiculous thing about academic boundaries, isn't it? Oh. Don't get me going. Then, then let's get going on that. I, I can see you and I would agree very yeah. energetically about that. Yeah. Um, somebody says uh, dogs would survive without us, but would we survive without our dogs? And, you know, I think yeah. we all feel that. Uh, uh, yeah. um, have you thought about whether a dog yeah. would stay in its own home in that first generation without us and then raise its young there or abandon the human home and live out in the wild? Depends what's there. I mean, I think they'd stay if there was plenty of food. Yeah, if they can get in and out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. My, have, yeah. My um, worst nightmare is the my my dog trapped inside my home when I disappear and she can't get out. Yeah. And she's pretty good at foraging on the counters and the cupboards. Um far too good at it, but at some point that yeah. would give out yeah. the food, food supply. And they would they would use, you know, Alan Goldman in his book, you know, uh, uh, The World Without Us, they'd use abandoned buildings. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. It, there's some great stuff going on in Namibia of a lot of dogs who are going into abandoned homes. They can hunt on their own and they have indoor shelter mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. people. I mean, I think a lot of it is the human arrogance that they'll never do well without us. But yeah, there, <laughs> there obviously was, I mean, the, the advantage to humans of having dogs for hunting is clear, but I'm interested in what the advantage to wolves was of having humans to help them hunt, but we won't, you know, I am, um, I, I do um, um, sort of um, experimental thought going backwards rather than forwards. Yeah. Well, Mark, well, there is some information. Um, there's a man named Mark Durr, D-E-R-R. -R. Oh, yes, I've seen his name and, in the work. And yeah. if there's anybody in the domestication world who is, just so it's so irritable that people write about like Ray Coppinger's ideas about dumps for which there's zero information. Mark Durer is the most knowledgeable person I'd say in the world about dog domestication. What the wolves, if you will, early wolves, you know, wolves transitioning got out of it was the social stimulation because they're social animals yeah. and that they form these reciprocal cooperative relationships. I put that out there because, I, I, just because his work is, people don't pick it up 
because it's, I don't know what the word is. I hate to use the word quote sexy, but, but really he, it's really the formation of these reciprocal bonds and wolves, you know, like social contact yeah. with one another, say. So this leads us to Catherine Morris's question, which is, oh, have you read What It's Like to Be a Dog by Gregory Burns? Yeah. Yes. Any yes. thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on, on dogs' emotions? I mean, I mean, they have a full range of emotions. You know, people are debating, do dogs feel guilt? And they cite the work of Alexandra Horowitz. Well, all Alexandra discovered, and I was actually her mentor, one of her mentors, all she discovered was, was that humans aren't good at reading the guilty look. She never said yes or no that dogs can't feel guilt. So you pick up, you know, popular rags and you pick up books. And what I like about Greg Burns' work a lot is people said dogs don't get jealous, but he did the neuroimaging to show that the same parts of the brain light up when dogs are in a situation in which you would expect the, them to be jealous. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I like his work and I like it because I think a lot of people who are not convinced by behavioral ethological data are more convinced by neuroimaging data, which to me is ridiculous, but I think, you know, that's I, the way I, it is. I had a, a, an interesting story just this morning, actually, when I was out on the field and there were about five humans and maybe 10 dogs and the humans were interacting with each other and the dogs were interacting with each other and you know there was a bit of interspecies but mainly we were on our own because we were comforting Christine who lost one of her spaniels uh, at the weekend and the interesting thing that she told us was that the other two spaniels not only did they grieve, but they also performed a ritual, which was to get, they, all, they have a bone each, and they got all three bones, including the dead dog's bone, and they put them all in the dead dog's bed. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then left them there. I, I just thought that was a really interesting, I thought that's not just emotion, that's actual ritual as well. Yeah, yes. The way that we associate with humans, and I wonder whether, animals that are not in such close human contact would also behave in that ritual sort of way over a death. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, yes. I've seen it in, I've seen it in wild elephants in Northern oh, Kenya. Oh yes, elephants do do it, don't they? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's just, you know, it's just the human arrogance. It's just the anthropocentrism that we need to find something that makes us different from and better than other animals. But, you know, there's no doubt. Yeah, that, yeah I mean, but yeah, yeah, grieving and ritual are not not something that separate us from other animals. Yeah, mm. Mm. You know, it, it's the first time I've really sort of thought about ritual. I'm, I've seen dogs grieve, but it was the first yeah. time I thought about ritual. That's a fascinating observation. Yeah, it's a it's a great story. Yeah, yeah it was really uh, interesting. Yeah, I think ritual is extremely important to dogs. I'm thinking just of um, I don't know if it's best to call it ritual or habit, but um, the the rituals that a human and dog share together um, over the course of a day um, is uh, a significant part of the the friendship that we mm -hmm. share and what bonds us. And Bella gets very upset if the rituals don't occur yeah. at the yeah. right time and in the right way. Well, yeah. I do too. Yeah, got to be the right habit. Right, um, and, and Jessica's right, because some people just write it off as habit or conditioning in a Skinnerian sense, but it, there's no reason to think it doesn't go deeper. I mean, and I- No, these, I, think, I, I think if you've owned dogs, you realize it does, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Just, just coming back to the, um, just, just briefly to the, to the um, possible live experiments. Was Montserrat a possibility when the volcano blew or was that a similar situation to Chernobyl? I don't know. Hmm. Do you, I don't know. I, I wouldn't sit and say I know enough about it to say. Yeah. Do you, Mark? No. no. Yeah. Um, Interesting then, question though. Yeah, I'm, I've got a, a question of my own. I think I've got to the end of the, oh no, 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 I haven't, here we go. Uh, not a question, but Patricia McConnell has written on this topic too. Um, what were your findings in previous books about the ethics of owning dogs? Did you come to positive conclusions? 
Yes. <laughs> well, like Jessica, like the dogs, isn't it? You know, it depends who the owner is, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, and the first thing I would say is I I don't believe, even though it's um, maybe written into the law, that you can own another living being. Um, so the language is a problem, but um, I think it's a deeply problematic. And in in my in past, I've thought, and you mentioned Run, Spot, Run at the beginning, which is about the ethics of, of owning animals, keeping animals captive as pets. And I, at maybe 10 years ago, would have said dogs are the least problematic because they're not really captive in the same way as a gecko in a in a glass tank or a bird in a cage. But I've really changed my thinking about that. And I would now say that the keeping of dogs is perhaps the most ethically problematic of the, the pet keeping that we engage in because the, the range and um, invisibility of the constraints that we place on them and the, the fear that we impose and the anxiety are, are really profound. If you start to look at it, I mean, just even in a, in a human home, the sources of fear for a dog um, might be diverse and, and many um, loud noises. And not <laughs> vacuum cleaner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and odors. And yeah. odors. And yeah. Um, and at the same time, as as being overstimulated in some ways, they're they're grossly understimulated in other ways, in, in that they are often not allowed to make choices about who their friends are if they even have any friends. Um, you know, we we impose a lot of unwanted and um, uninvited touching of dogs. Um, you know, how many people have come up to you in the park and um, patted your dog's head. And if, if you did, if somebody did that to me, I would call the police. Um, or if somebody did that to my daughter, I would call the police <laughs> or at least give them a smackdown. Um, yet it's, it occurs every day without our dogs and they don't give consent and don't have control. And so I think it's really problematic and worth, worth thinking about what we're doing to these creatures we claim to love. And do love. I mean, it's not that it's a fake claim, but um, it's complicated love. Yeah, it is complicated. Um, knowing your own dogs, um, you know, do you think they would be more likely to compete, coexist, or cooperate? Can you tell by their personality how they're likely to behave in a post human world? I mean, I think it's hard to do. I think a lot of it, you know, and Jessica and I talked around that question is their experience. I mean, when I lived in the mountains, I'd open up my door and they'd be out. There were no yeah. cars, there were predators and there were dogs on the road. Um, I think that some would have, I mean, I think their individual personalities might've made some miss me or us more than yeah. others, but I think they would have done well, uh, you yeah. know, without yeah. a, but, but one of the main parts of the book too, is not only looking at all, you know, well, well, I mean, I was going to say all the biological variables, but personality is biological in that sense. So I think that risk, risk, you could argue risk takers would do better, but they might put themselves at risk and not survive. Yeah. So it yeah. comes down to the individual dog. We're going to have to stop. I've just noticed it's a minute to nine and I will be in trouble. Oh, stop too bad. One, one last thing, an interesting point. In English, we say we own a pet, whereas in languages like Korean, they say the equivalent of raising an animal, an interesting mm -hmm. reflection of pet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I would say I share my home with a pet. When I, when I lost a much loved dog, um, somebody in the university sent me a condolence email which started um, with the deathless sentence, having once been managed by dogs myself, I know how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say having many times been controlled. <laughs> 
Anyway, we must stop. That's been absolutely tremendous. Let me just check that I say uh, that I, I say my my closing things. Well, the the first thing is to say thank you to you both. Um, that has been terrific, and I hope that that we can engage a little bit more. Maybe I've got lots of lots of thoughts. All my questions are sitting here un unanswered because you had a very very enthusiastic audience. If you would like to purchase a copy of Jessica and Mark's book, A Dog's World, which is a, a tremendous book, um, it will be available from our partner bookseller, uh, Fox Lane Books. And for more information on book sales, uh, have a look on the website or go to their, uh, go to their website, foxlanebooks.co.uk. And finally, we, we very much hope that you will continue to be engaged with the York Festival of Ideas and check out our web website, yorkfestivalofideas.com for the details of all the events in the festival programme, which I think is sort of coming towards an end now, but there's more to come. We'd love to hear your thoughts on these events and continue the conversations using the hashtag at York Ideas.